Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Ag Forecast brought to you by Agribol, the makers of Morning Farm Report. Our software gives growers the insights to make the best decisions possible at their operations. Well, this might possibly be the most important forecast I've given all year. Here we are on Monday, August 21st, looking at a map produced by NOAA showing you the total cloud cover in form of a percent. And what you're seeing here is that it looks like the center part of the country is going to be dealing with quite a bit of cloud cover that could obscure the view of this total solar eclipse. Now remember, it starts late in the morning here in Oregon and cuts across the Pacific Northwest. We expect good viewing conditions out here simply because this is the dry season and it's typically less cloudy this time of year out here. Although I will throw this out there, there are quite a bit of forest fires right now in the Pacific Northwest, especially here in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And some of that smoke may obscure the view of the total solar eclipse. But as, I, as you get toward the center part of the country, we're dealing with an interesting weather system, which we'll detail in just a few moments, that could produce not only a lot of shower and thunderstorm activity right here, especially in parts of Iowa, maybe South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota, this region, but the, the, the cirrus cloud shield that will result from this thunderstorm activity could spread spread over a huge section of the Corn Belt. Now something interesting might happen though. If you do have to watch the eclipse through cloud cover, you will likely still be able to see it as long as the cloud cover is thin enough, which it might be in some locations. But if it's not, the enhancement of the darkness due to the clouds could make it look pretty dark outside. Now a common myth with the total solar eclipse is that we expect, like you may expect it to get like pitch black out like at midnight. That will not happen. We'll have indirect sunlight that will, of course, prevent that. Uh, but it's a pretty neat thing to see if we do have some cloud cover, how the enhancement could make it darker. Now, why we get this eclipse is a pretty cool thing to talk about very, very briefly. You see, when we look at the sun and the moon in our sky, they look to be about the same size. And that's because the moon is about 1 400th of the diameter of the sun. But it's also, the sun, well, is about 400 a times farther away than the moon is. And as a consequence, they appear to be the both, uh, both to be about the same size in the sky. So when it passes, when the moon passes between the earth and sun, uh, we get this eclipse feature. If I had to pick a spot to go, I'd head towards southern Illinois, possibly into parts of Kentucky and Tennessee, because it does look um, like it will be kind of cloudy as we get over here toward parts of South Carolina. So there you go. That's the forecast, uh, you know, for, for the cloud cover on the solar eclipse. And I apologize if you're watching this on Tuesday or Wednesday, and it's already happened. But anyway, uh, let's move on. Now, if you do happen to miss the eclipse on August 21st, which is going to follow this path, just want to let you know, stick around till uh, April of 2024. We've got another one. And if you miss that one, hopefully you'll be sticking around long enough for the 2045 total solar eclipse, which will be on August 12th, which will run right through here. So you got a few chances if you miss out on this particular one. Just thought I'd show you that. Now, what I've been really interested in as an atmospheric scientist is to see if the total solar eclipse affects daytime high temperatures. So I'm going to show you an animation from the NAM model. This is a higher resolution version of the model that we run that goes out about 60 hours. So starting at around 7 a.m. Central Time here in uh, um, on Monday, check out what the temperature field looks like across the country. Now, see all of this? That's not from the solar eclipse. That's actually cooler temperatures due to cloud cover. And then the really darker colors, these greens you see coming in at the end, that's the front passing really knocking our temperatures off as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. So unfortunately, I couldn't see this, but it's actually telling a much more important story in terms of our weather this week. So why don't we transition to weather as August is an incredibly important month when talking about our corn and soybean production in the middle part of the country. By the way, I just want to make sure that everybody knows to be safe when you are viewing the eclipse. Uh, even at totality, I would still keep, if you're in the region that has a total uh, solar eclipse, please keep your glasses very, very nearby. There's a brief moment when you can look at the eclipse at totality and not risk damaging your eyes. But more importantly, uh, this these glasses uh, will not protect anything. Okay, so let's get here to Monday's convective outlook. We are watching for a region of enhanced uh, risk for showers and thunderstorms across parts of Nebraska, getting mostly into Iowa, Northern Illinois, and Wisconsin. Now, what's going on here is that we have larger, a large region, I should say, of higher atmospheric pressure spinning clockwise off the Northeast. And what that does is that funnels a lot of moisture uh, in that clockwise flow into this weaker area of lower pressure, which is really just sitting along this cold frontal boundary that's stalled out here across the Corn Belt. 
Now, this boundary is what's going to give us the lift to produce the clouds that are going to be obscuring the, the view of the um, solar eclipse, but also producing the showers and storms. And this is an area that needs these showers and storms. Well, let's take a look at it from a perspective of how much precipitation we're going to be able to see here. This animation, which you just saw, plays out over the next 10 days and kind of shows us in 24-hour chunks where we're expecting to see precipitation accumulate. So if we get, uh, let's get to the start of, uh, of Tuesday morning. Here we are, 1 a.m. Tuesday morning. This is the region we're expecting to see all that shower and thunderstorm activity over the 24 hours uh, before 1 a.m. on Tuesday morning. So again, you can see this is the region where we're going to be obscuring that eclipse, but also potentially bringing in quite a bit of precipitation. But watch as I continue this on out. We can see that that front sags south. And by the time we get into, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to really clear out the Corn Belt, bring in some cooler temperatures uh, and make, you know, for, for a nicer middle to end of the week. In fact, for those folks that are going to be doing some uh, some harvesting down here in the southern part of our Corn Belt, you know, it looks like mid to end of week is going to be a decent time period for you uh, to get the, the corn out of the field. You can see how getting all the way into next Saturday. Uh, even in towards Sunday, we do keep the center part of our Corn Belt right in through here drier than average. Now, just for another perspective, this is the long range European forecast this next seven days. You can see most of the heavy precip is confined to this area here where the front is uh, on Monday into Tuesday. So that's where our thunderstorm activity is going to be confined to drier week follows that. And that's really what the models are showing. Now, I just want to point out one quick thing. This is rainfall that we're expecting to hit a region that over the last 30 days has been anywhere between one and four inches drier than average. So this is going to be some beneficial rainfall for this part of the Corn Belt here in, in Iowa and in parts of Illinois. So uh, just kind of to point that out, that's going to help our bean crop in that area. Okay, look what it does to temperatures. Monday's high temperatures. Look, we got 90s creeping up in southern Illinois, into Kansas, into parts of Missouri as well. Watch as that front passes on Tuesday into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You see, after that front passes, we bring in a much cooler pattern again uh, into the eastern half of the country. And we can see that really well here. We always like to look at the flow of the atmosphere. Let's let this run out once. We'll pause at the beginning and kind of get a better picture here. So on Monday, we can see the trough that's going to be responsible for helping kick off that low pressure system really start to evolve into a more permanent, uh, or not more permanent, but a more um, kind of transparent feature here. You can see the trough axis coming right in through the northern part of the Corn Belt. And it is going to be ahead of that trough that we make that low pressure center that drags that front through. After it goes through, look at the trough digging into the eastern part of the country. That's the cooler weather I just showed you in our, our forecast for high temperatures. We then tend to move toward a pattern where a ridge likes to build out west by next weekend. That keeps the basically the entirety of the eastern half of the country in a cooler pattern. And what has started off to be a cool August looks to be continuing to be a cool August as we finish out the month. Now, looking a bit, little bit longer view here, what we've got here is the European model's long range view getting us out into mid-September. So this is a 51 member ensemble run showing you 32 days of average two meter temperature anomalies. And what we're seeing is a very consistent picture with the cooler uh, center uh, of the United States kind of temperature pattern with warmth out west. Now, I want to introduce you to a new term I'm going to talk a lot about this winter. And that term is, uh, is basically referring to a pattern called the Pacific North American pattern. I've mentioned it before, but let's just kind of bring it up here. Now, what we're looking at here is the, the Pacific North American pattern uh, as it is centered around a zero line. Now, when the value of the PNA goes above zero, that generally means a ridge out west and a trough in the center or eastern part of the country. If it is below zero, that generally means a trough out west and a ridge in the center part of the country. So remember the heat wave we had in mid-July, mid to end of July? Here's the negative PNA pattern that that was uh, associated with. The cooler start to August that we've experienced has basically been due to this positive uh, PNA pattern that we've seen uh, for the first part of August. Now, what we see here is that we get into the end of August and the beginning of September. Most models are agreeing here on another kind of positive PNA pattern. So ridge out west, trough in the center part of the country. So these are two things that are matching up well. And this is from a different model, not the ECMWF that you see here. So this is giving me some, uh, you know, some additional kind of strength in that cooler pattern forecast. And you do need to hear me say that if this continues as we get into late September into early October, this does bring in the threat for possibly an earlier frost. But we'll be looking out for those that kind of one off event as we get into the month of September, especially toward the end of September, if this pattern continues to hang on. 
Now, one last thing I want to update you on is the outlook for the tropics. We've been discussing how the tropics are primed for tropical activity. In other words, hurricanes, tropical storms, stuff like that. Here we have the remnants of Harvey moving across the Yucatan Peninsula, getting over in here into the Bay of Campeche and eventually into Mexico. I'm watching this closely because the remnants of Harvey could move back into the Gulf of Mexico, which is very warm and potentially spark some tropical activity. Another, you know, basically round of tropical showers and thunderstorms, which could impact the coastal regions. We're also watching this thing uh, north of the island of Hispaniola, uh, which has really struggled to get organized due to some strong upper level subsidence and also some wind shear. But we need to keep an eye out for where this goes over the coming days because it could interact with Florida. Something to bring up, though, is as we get into the month of September, there is some hint that the overall kind of um, weather patterns that favor tropical development in the open Atlantic could be suppressed by a larger feature we call the Madden Julian Oscillation. But I will be keeping a close eye on that as, again, the tropics are primed for any development and that could potentially move right up the gut of the Mississippi and impact our harvest weather. So we'll be on the lookout for that as we move toward the peak of the hurricane season. So a lot to kind of digest here, a lot of great things to be on the lookout for, but I just want to bring all this to your attention as we get into this very important week here toward the end of August and then as we get into our forecast for September. With that, we'll wrap this up. We hope you look forward to Agrable's next Ag Forecast on Thursday. To get morning farm report for your operations, complete with a daily email that shows a snapshot of your field conditions each morning, go to morningfarmreport.com. Sign up for that free account. Full grower accounts are free if you sign up for our Sustainable Yield Program or for growers who work with AD Merchandisers. Until Thursday, be safe with the solar eclipse and have a great week. Thank you.